Good afternoon. So, sorry we're starting late. I can't, I can't find the rest of my officer team. You know, I'm going to call them actually right now. I'm going to call, I'm going to call Mary Alice to see what, what they're doing. Where are you at? We're supposed to be starting right now. Well, the officers and I gave the guest speaker a tour, and we kind of sort of got lost. Well, that's brilliant. Well, uh, well, I got like a bunch of foragers here waiting. So you think you can like make it in time today? Um, I think we should go to the elevator, maybe. Yeah, Even yeah, the elevator. The floor, Do what? What floor are we on? Oh, we're on five? I mean, come on, you should know this. Oh, okay, hold on. We're going to the elevator. We're pushing the button. We're pushing the button. It's not working. <laughs> elevator. Elevator works. Maybe you should have taken the stairs. That's exercise, Travis. Oh, I'm sorry. It's not opening. <laughs> it's really not opening. <laughs> I don't see an elevator in here, by the way. Where are you coming in at? What? I don't see an elevator in here. Well, I don't know. Is there one outside? I think there's one outside. Maybe we can, like, run up the stairs. Come on, elevator. Okay. Ah, elevator. Elevator. <laughs> I, I really think you need to use the stairs. <laughs> yeah. The guest speaker thinks that it's funny. Oh, that's what the elevator is for. You're on five? Oh, oh. <laughs> That's what happens when you work with a bunch of women. Welcome to the 2016 Arkansas 4-H Staterama. I am 4-H. So first off, who's all excited to be here? I was expecting that to be a lot quieter, so very good job, very good job. All right, so first off, start off with, who is this their first time to be here at Staterama? Wow. Everybody look around. That is a lot. That is awesome. Everybody round of applause. All right, well, I asked that question, so I don't have to ask, who is this their last time to be at Staterama? Aww. Uh, uh, I know, I, I feel I feel you. After five years, this is my, this is my last Staterama. So, <laughs> I know, now we're all going to be like, aww. All right, so, of course, the main reason we're here, right, is to come for competitions, but this week we have a lot of fun activities that I hope you're going to enjoy that we have dispersed out through the week. For example, County Night tonight and the Jones Center that we're gonna get to go to, do some ice skating and maybe even some dancing, right? So, yeah, I hear some, yeah, woo woo. So, I know everybody's looking forward to this week. I know I am, so let's get started. So first off, uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Cameron Schaefer from uh, Fulton County and Jeremiah Williams from Ashley County? Prairie, Prairie County, I was close, right? No. no. All right, so lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance and Forage Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, 
I pledge my head to clear thinking, my heart to bear loyalty, my hand to love and serve, my mouth to bear living, my blood, my community, my country, and my world. Thank you, Jeremiah and Cameron. I would now like to ask Mr. Noel Washburn, the interim 4-H unit director, to come to the stage and welcome you to state Arama. Thank you, Travis. And I am not going to make the ladies mad because I can see there's a lot of them out there. So uh, I'm going to be very nice. And I work with a bunch of them, too, so I have to be really nice. Well, welcome to State 4-H Arama. Pretty cool. Well, as I said, my name's Noah Washburn. I've been the 4-H program director for going on six years. Good gosh. And then I've had the great opportunity to be the interim program leader for the last six months. So however long, this may be my only chance to do this. So this is kind of a special moment for me, being a nine-year-old that could not stand in front of one person and hold my head up. I'm getting to do it in front of you guys with the little things in your tummy and all still happening. Gosh, I don't know what it is. I want to congratulate all of you all for making it this far. I know some of y'all worked very hard, competed, and competed well, obviously. And uh, you reached a level, this re level of competition, and uh, really proud of that. You truly are the best of the best. You know our 4-H motto? Make to make the best better. Just checking to see how many 4-Hs we have out there. So we're also going to be doing a lot of that this week. You probably won't even real realize that, will you? When you leave campus on Friday morning, you want to leave unaffected by the experience this week, especially some of you all, this is your last time. You know, back a long time ago, Johnny is sitting up here can remember this time probably, uh, <laughs> I sat where you are, sorry, he's right there, I don't know. Uh, I sat where you are, but not right here, about 750 miles northeast in uh, Indiana at Purdue University, 4-H Roundup, I was one of you sitting there. My stomach was a little in knots and a lot of excitement because I was there, as some of you all out there, probably more goal-oriented. You came to actually compete and do a good job. You know, I was one of those that was for the fun part of 4-H and compete because I did like to win. So we have a lot of mixture for that here this week, and I hope you all, uh, whichever one you choose or both, you have a good time and to make this state 4-H aroma the best it ever has been. All right, now what I'd like to do is uh, introduce some folks that are very important to me, of course, because I get to work with them every day, and they're the ones that make this thing possible and uh, for you to be here, of course. Starting off with, if they would come forward, uh, we'll recognize all of them, our state citizenship leadership coordinator and also the one that made these officers so wonderful, uh, Angie Friel. I had to put my glasses on. Johnny relates to that as well. I want to also bring up the front 4-H Center Program Director, Director Miss Shannon Caldwell, if I could spit that out. <laughs> Probably a few of y'all spend the night with her, right? Next, 4-H Mentoring Coordinator, and my right and left hand, Tori Copeland. Also, our 4-H after-school coordinator, Erica Fields. <laughs> and the big shoes to fill, and he does a pretty good job of them, if you see the side of his foot. Our 4-H science coordinator, Rick Fields. <laughs> and our shooting sports coordinator, Mr. Rex Roberg's not here. He went home sick. Actually, he was. I know what y'all are thinking. He was sick. He told me yesterday. We didn't want to get it, right? We want to have fun the rest of this week. Also, I'm not sure it's here, Miss Patricia Maddox, our 4-H financial manager. Don't see her. Yeah, clap, please. Because they've all helped out. Also, our two fund development people, Brian Helms. I think he's buying flyer, flowers somewhat thing for tomorrow night, and also Jackson Alexander. I think they're preparing for the deal tomorrow night. Next on the list, 
is our Arkansas 4 H Center Director, Mr. JJ Pittman. And, uh, and probably one of the most important people for this week, better known as Orama Mama. <laughs> and I hope she's not here to hear that. Actually. <laughs> our 4-H events coordinator, and she's really the glue that holds this thing together, and you all probably know that, especially the agents, Miss Priscilla Scott. Did she make it? <laughs> probably not. She had some issues trying to get everybody checked in, so she was out in a little panic mode, so I'm glad I had to leave. Uh, okay, one little group here I want to, that we've had opportunity this summer to actually hire five summer interns in our building basically because they all work across all over the state office and I want to uh, they've helped out at everything we've done this summer and they all are past 4-H'ers 4-H alumni and some of them are still currently 4-H'ers <laughs> so we'll bring them up as well Molly White <laughs> Reagan Grubbs And Heather Jackson. Mary Alice Cole. Oh, she's hiding in the back. Well, I tell you what, can't find good help. And last but not least, Olivia McClure. Give them a big round of applause. This is the people that you can go to this week if you have any problems, and they've made this week possible. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I got a, two more things here real quick, and I'll turn it back over, but this is the only time I, they will let me talk, so I'm going to use it. Uh, I also want to thank personally and also recognize the people that really make this thing happen year-long and started probably a few months ago is our county agents and program assistants. They're the reason that the 4-H program exists in the state of Arkansas. Without them, you wouldn't be seeing me up here, or any of us, all right? If y'all please stand for a little appreciation, please. All right, Johnny, I know it's hard. Go ahead and stand up. That's okay, a standing ovation. That's probably what I said, wasn't it? I, went, I didn't write that down. Should have wrote that down. See, that's why I'm not up here. One more time, I'm going to do something else here. The agent said, no, they already did. Johnny can't do it but once. The final group that I want to recognize, and just them stand, please. Let's y'all want to give them a standing ovation as well, is our 4-H volunteers. They are also the glue that holds this program together and to get you all here. With the volunteers, please stand to be recognized. Thank you for what you do, and I have one more thing. <laughs> See, I've got the mic. Y'all are in trouble. And I'm not going to use the panorama or whatever it is because it did say a ROM on it, but they didn't say it wouldn't work. So I'm going to do video so nobody do obscene things. But we have the 4-H national mod, uh, campaign happening, so I'm going to take a little video of you all and let Angie put it on Facebook because I don't know how to do it. <laughs> Just being honest. So I'm going to take this. As I go around my room like this, you all kind of act like you're happy to be here. Hang on, I'm not ready. <laughs> All right, I'm done. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Noah, for that amazing welcome. Um, now, here's the fun part. Are you guys ready to make some real noise? And I mean real noise. So, we're starting a new tradition this year. We're going to have a district roll call. The district that wins will receive this awesome traveling trophy that will be kept in the 4-H Center display case by the auditorium. So get ready to show us your 4-H spirit. Ready? Okay. First, we have the Ozark District. Awesome, awesome. 
I'm not partial to any district at all either. Uh, okay, next we have the Ouachita District. And last but not least, we have the Delta District. Okay. Uh, great job, everybody. That was awesome. And we hope that you keep that spirit throughout the rest of this week. Now, Autumn Gregg, Ozark District Vice President, will come and give you some information about the upcoming week. As you have noticed, we have changed some things for Orama this year. On Wednesday night, there will be a donor dinner and the Awards of Excellence ceremony. If you have been awarded a record book scholarship, are an advanced record book winner this year, or won a Category A scholarship, you will attend the donor dinner on Wednesday night at 5.30. You should dress formally for this donor dinner. A bus will pick you up in the Maple, in the Maple Hill lot number 42 at 5 o'clock p.m. Everyone else who will not be receiving an award will eat in the cafeteria between 4.30 and 6 p.m. on Wednesday night and attend the award ceremony at 7.30 p.m. that will be held here in the Union. You may walk or park in the parking deck beside the Arkansas Union. You will need to dress in business casual. Please no jeans, t-shirts, or shorts. If your county wants to order pizza for Wednesday or Thursday night, please make sure to place your order at the AAE 4HA table set up on the Maple Hill Courtyard on Tuesday from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. and Wednesday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Please note that if you are ordering pizza for Wednesday, you need to have your order in by Tuesday at 3 o'clock p.m. And if you're ordering pizza for Thursday, you must have your pizza order in by Wednesday at 4 o'clock p.m. Pizzas will be delivered Wednesday after the dance at 11.30 p.m. to the Maple Hill Courtyard and Thursday at the Jones Center. You must order and pay by noon to get pizzas that night. They take cash, check, or credit card. We're going to make a big statement on campus by wearing our state 4-H Orama t-shirts on Thursday, so be sure to show your 4-H spirit. Also, all ambassadors will need to be wearing their ambassador shirts at the closing assembly on Thursday. So, who wants to get some prizes this week? Yeah? Yeah? Okay, well, the college career fair and the Bumpers College picnic is at Maple Hill Courtyard on Wednesday from 11.30 to 1.30 p.m. So, be sure to bring your passport that came in your registration packet to the fair. Visit each booth and have them stamp your passport. You must get all of the stamps to be eligible for the prize. Turn in your completed passports by 1.30 p.m. at the 4-H booth in the courtyard. Great door prizes will be given away, given away using the passports, 4-H, and social media throughout this week. Just a reminder, each of you have signed the 4-H Code of Conduct, and everyone is expected to follow the code. In the event that anyone has broken the code of conduct, a review board is in place to take care of the situation. I hope everyone has a good week. State officer elections are a very important part of state Arama each year. 4-H oper officers have the responsibility to represent Arkansas 4-H throughout the year at many events and they take their job very seriously. We're about to hear from our state officer candidates, and you will have a chance to vote for them with your cell phones or at a voting booth set up at the Maple Hill at Maple Hill Thursday afternoon if you can't access the cell phone. Remember that these are the are only candidates for the state officer positions. The state forage president will come from the officers at large that you elect. These those interested in the president position uh, participated in an interview process that will that help them determine who will be the forage president this year. This year we have six candidates and four positions to fill, so be sure to vote for four and no more, no less. The candidates will give their speeches in the order that they will appear on the ballot. So first to the stage is Mary Alice Cole from Izzard County. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
see what happens. Is this working? Yeah, okay. Hey, guys. Hey. Okay, are you ready? Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb. Mary had a little lamb whose fleece was white as snow. And everywhere that Mary went, Mary went, Mary went. Everywhere that Mary went, her lamb was sure to go. It followed her up here today, here today, here today. It followed her up here today, which was against the rules. <laughs> It made us all laugh and play, laugh and play, laugh and play. It made us all laugh and play. So Miss Angie kicked him out. <laughs> After the lamb was gone, lamb was gone, lamb was gone. After the lamb was gone, we could carry on. Thank you. My name is Mary Alice Cole, and I am from Izzard County. And I have been a member of Izzard County 4-H for the past six years. Over the course of six years, I've been able to accomplish more than I could ever imagine. But my biggest accomplishment is serving you guys as one of your 2015-2016 State 4-H Officer at Large. So please help me in taking the next step in my 4-H journey. And don't forget to vote, vote, don't forget to vote, Mary Alice Cole. Thank you. I assure you that'll be stuck in my head later today. <laughs> Thank you, Mary Alice. Next, we have Lane Fritch from Benton County. Oh, wow. Before 4-H, I was missing something very important in my life, and I knew it. You see, I didn't realize it then, but my 4-H journey and had begun that first step into the, my very first meeting. And my yellow brick road turned green. Hi, my name is Lane Fritch, and I am from Benton County, and I would like to be your next office, state officer at large. Now you see, I knew another, I know three other characters that were also missing something very important in their lives. A scarecrow, a tin man, and a cowardly lion. You see, the scarecrow was missing a brain, but when he finally got his brain, he became a great leader in the land of Oz. He became able to think clearly. So you see, the tin man was missing a heart. When he finally got his heart, he, was, he became kind, true, and sympathetic. He became loyal. And this cowardly lion, he was scared of his shadow because he had no courage at all. When he finally got his courage, he was able to serve others more efficiently because he wasn't worrying about the fears and failures of the past. He had a larger service. Because each of these characters found what was missing, their overall health had changed dramatically. They lived better lives. Now, they only lived better lives and changed and found what was missing because there was somebody else inspiring them, and that was Dorothy. I had somebody else inspiring me, too. Who's that? That's you guys. Whether you know me at a personal level or not, you have inspired me to make my best better and who I am today. Because of 4-H, well, I wouldn't be who I am, definitely. I wouldn't have been the president of my 4-H club. I wouldn't have been the vice president of my county council. I wouldn't have won state instrumental last year. I wouldn't have been a teen star or state ambassador. I wouldn't have met you guys. And I wouldn't have gone to DC or going to National Congress this fall because I wouldn't have been very motivated to finish my record book. Because you guys inspired me, I've done these things. 4-H is home, and there's no place like home. Thank you. Did you catch that green brick road? Haha, <laughs> badoom. <laughs> Thank you, Lane. Next up, we have Cheyenne Gillum. 
from Independence County. How are you guys today? <laughs> okay, so a lot of you wear a lot of hats, but I have plenty of shoes, just like you. Hello, my name is Cheyenne Gillum, and I'm 17 years old and a member of the Cave City 4-H Club. And today, I have brought to you my credentials to be your next officer at large. First off, my cowboy boots. These boots have been through countless hours at county, district, state, and national events. I'm an Arkansas Teen Star, Arkansas Ambassador, and a State Fair Junior Ambassador. I've held all of, all of the offices at my local club for the past 12 years. I've been through a lot of stuff with these boots, but I'm willing to go through a lot more with y'all. Next up, would have to be my cheer shoes. 4-H has never had a bigger cheerleader than me, doing what I love and loving what I do. And what it comes down to, in the end, is that 4-H is the best thing that there is. Third, is my dance shoes. Just like with 4-H, there's a lot of practice. I put a lot of practice in with these shoes. And I'm willing to put in a lot of time with my 4-H family. I went through a lot of competitions, just like a lot of y'all will do this week. And I'm not afraid to help out whenever I'm needed. So altogether, I'm not afraid to work hard and help y'all with whatever y'all need. I'm always going to be there to cheer y'all on whenever y'all don't feel like y'all can. And I'm going to practice and get things done for y'all the best way possible. Oh, yeah. Let me tell you about my fourth pair of shoes. These are some shoes that I hope to fulfill this next year. Just like Marilyn Monroe said, give a girl the right shoes and she can conquer the world. So vote for me, Shine Gillum, to be your next officer at large. Thank you. Thank you, Cheyenne. You just might be a shoe in. Uh. <laughs> Next, we have Kimberly Kay from Benton County. Do you know what powers a robot? Do you know what powers you in your 4-H career? Hello, my name is Kimberly Kay. I am from Benton County, and this is my 10th year in 4-H. A robot has to have a common source of power, and that power source has to be energized completely, or else nothing will work pr properly. The energy source of a robot has a lot of responsibility. The first responsibility of this energy source is the structure. The structure of my 4-H career is my parents, adult volunteers, county extension agents, and all of you, my fellow 4-Hers, who have given me the chance to grow and gain skills as a leader. In my 4-H career, I have been able to be a, uh, in leadership levels on the club, county, state, and national level. I've been able to be part of the first video team in Arkansas and help that team grow <clears throat> and gain skills as we go. I've been able to be part of the 4-H small trend spotter squad. The second responsibility of, a robot, of the energy source of a robot is the wheels. Wheels can take a robot to many different places and across many different surfaces, just like 4-H can take you anywhere. I have participated in 4-H in three different states and have been able to travel all across the state and country throughout my 4-H career. 
I have participated in a variety of projects, including dairy, robotics, leadership, arts and crafts, and pretty much anything 4-H has to offer. Because why not? 4-H gives you all those opportunities. All of my experiences in 4-H have created me to become a diverse 4-H'er who knows a little bit about everything. The third part, the third responsibility of the robot is the wires. Wires connect everything together. Each part is as important as the next, and they have to be connected to, to each other to work properly. The robot has to have the energy it needs to work. If the robot isn't energized enough, it won't work properly. When a robot is energized enough and works properly, its light turns green and it can go. When a 4 h is ready to go, their green hearts shine through. So when voting for your next 2016-2017 State Officer at Large, please remember me, Kimberly Kay. I was trying to come up with another joke, but I terminated that idea. <laughs> next, thank you, Kimberly. Next, we have Sarah Toll from Prairie County. Sorry, guys, I'm a little forgetful. <laughs> hey, guys. Okay, hi, y'all. My name is Sarah Toll. I am from Prairie County, and I've been participating in 4-H for about eight years now. I've been involved since I've, I was nine, and I've been learning a lot through 4-H. And I'm going to show you some of that with my... Euphemism, I guess, is the word I'm looking for. I also started learning how to tie ties young, a little bit back. And when I first started trying to learn, it looked a lot like this. I, I don't know how I got that, honestly. Um, so it's kind of like my life when I first started 4-H. It was without form. It was a little messy. Not quite sure where we were going with it. But as I started to grow in my 4-H career, I got to tying it to where it looked like it was supposed to, just a normal tie. Like when I started my 4-H meetings, I started to learn how I was supposed to do things, how things worked in 4-H, and learning new things as we're supposed to do in 4-H. But was that good enough for me? No, I had to strive for excellence. So. I started learning how to tie more complex ties. Like in my 4-H experience, I learned how to do new things. I participated in community service. Uh, sorry, y'all. Anyway, I participated in community service. I'm an ambassador now. I'm a teen star. I just won my record book this year, which I'm really excited about. And I've done a lot of other things through 4-H that I would have never gotten to do through just staying at home and not doing anything. But I'm hoping that this year will be my year to excel. That is what I call my slip knot. I've learned that, and it takes me about 10 seconds to tie a tie. It comes real handy when it comes to banquet, so if you ever need anybody to help you with that. <laughs> like I said, in, in my 4-H career and as a state officer, I would love to be here to help you, whether it be with your ties, with your personal problems, with your speeches, anything. I promise I'm a better speaker. <laughs> anyway, so can you help me? reach my dreams of this being my slipknot. Don't forget, vote for Sarah Toll. Thank you. I assure you, she tried to teach me that, and it did not, it's not that easy, OK? <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Next, we have Bree Lanthrop from Drew County.
Oh, hey guys, I was just listening to a little music to help calm me down. You know, music is a very big part of my life. I listen to music when I'm sad, worried, nervous, or happy. One thing I've noticed about music is there are two key parts, the bass and the treble. Music is just not balanced without one or the other. It's the same way in 4-H. We need a good balance of the treble, the shy, introverted kids, and the bass, the outgoing, extroverted kids. I'm a treble and in all about that bass world. But I know 4-H is the one place where a treble can always shine. Hi, I'm Bree Lanthrop. I'm 17 and have been in 4-H since I was 8 years old. I'm a member and current president of the Drew County Cornelia 4-H Club in Drew County. I remember when my homeschool group first decided to start a 4-H club. I wondered, what is 4-H? As the program assistant started to explain the club to us, I got really excited. She really caught my attention when she started to explain the officers, especially the photographer. I love photography, but being the shy little girl I was, I felt crushed when she said, if you want to hold an office, you'll need to give a short speech. My heart sank. I knew there was no way I could stand in front of a group of people and give a speech. It took me a long time to become comfortable giving speeches, but I did work up enough courage to run for office the next year and had and have now held every office in a 4-H club except for vice president. I never knew that sitting in that first 4-H meeting how important 4-H would become in my life. It has given me opportunities that I never would have had without it. I have had the honor of representing my county and my state at the National Web Invitational in Indiana and attend CWF. And this fall, I'll have the privilege of attending the National 4-H Congress in Atlanta, Georgia. All of this has been possible through what 4-H has offered me. It is still really hard for me to stand before you today, but I know 4-H is the one place I'm always accepted. When, being so shy and introverted, I've not always made friends easily, but I know when I go to a 4-H event or activity, I'll always be accepted for who I am and surrounded by friends I have made from all over the state. No matter who you are and what your interests are, you can always find someone who shares a similar interest. 4-H is a very big part of my life and has helped make me the person I am today. That's why I stand before you. I want to be your next officer at large to show other youth the importance of 4-H and the impact it can have on our lives. No matter if you're the base or the treble, you can always find a place to shine and make the best better. So remember, I want to be the treble that balances off your state officer team. Vote Bree Lanthrop as your next officer at large. I was hoping there's going to be music as you went off stage. I was going to be dancing my way up. No, okay. <laughs> Let's give all of these state officer candidates a round of applause. <laughs> you all did an excellent job on your speeches and taking on a new challenge and to strengthen your leadership skills. Remember, a vote for four candidates only, and you may only vote once. It's important, once, you know. This year, uh, you will vote, remember you will vote by your cell phone, or if you don't have a cell phone, it'll be on Maple Hill South, room 145, from 3 p.m. until 6 p.m. And I'm sure you can find somewhere else if you don't remember that, bad memory, Thir on Thursday. So uh, there are signs up in the courtyard to show you the way. <laughs> vote at your earliest convenience to make sure that you, you cast your vote before the voting period ends. Oh. And um, on your phone, you can vote from 6 p.m. today through 6 p.m. on Thursday. And there's a QR code on your name tag that you can take a picture of, and it'll take you straight to it. Ah, techie, right? <laughs> All right, guys. I'm really excited to announce uh, introduce our speaker to you today. Farm Credit has been gracious enough to sponsor our guest speaker, Mr. Kyle Sheely. Kyle Sheely is an inspiring speaker, writer, and youth expert who has challenged thousands of teens across the nation to live better stories. When he's not on a plane or a stage, Kyle is at home in Springfield, Missouri, where he lives with his beautiful wife, Lindsay, and their three awesome children. He's still not sure how he ended up with such an incredible family, but he's trying to lay low in case this whole thing was some sort of mistake. In his free time, Kyle enjoys reading, writing, and, help, and helping his kids build forts out of household furniture. Our speaker today has been working with students ever since he was a student. He's spoken to teenagers across the United States, and he once talked to a guy in Canada. 
He's given talks to thousands of students, published numer numerous articles in teen magazines, and even taught himself how to do a cartwheel. When he's not speaking, he's hanging out with his family in Missouri and trying to keep his kids from climbing up the bookshelf. Please welcome Kyle Sheely. Thank you. How are you guys doing? All right, guys, I'm super excited to be here. Uh, my name is Kyle. I want to tell you guys a story. When I was in high school, I was in student council, and uh, one of the events that we did my junior year was this event called Every 15 Minutes. Any of you guys ever heard of Every 15 Minutes? Yeah, it's still done in, in schools around the country. And what the event is, is it's all designed to hammer home the statistic that every 15 minutes, somebody dies in an alcohol-related car accident. So the enti it's an entire day of events, uh, starting with in the morning, that when you first pull up to the school, there's a, a car accident that has happened in the front of the school. They stage a car accident, and everyone has to get out and walk around it, and there's fire trucks and ambulances, and they land a helicopter and everything. Uh, and, and they tell you, hey, this isn't real, but they want you to go through the emotions of, oh my gosh, like what if this actually happen and then throughout the day every 15 minutes they pull a student out of class they paint their face white they put them in a white shirt and then through the rest of the day that student is not allowed to talk they're not allowed to really interact with the other students they just go to their classes and they are a silent reminder for the rest of the day uh, of this statistic so you start out the day and there's nobody uh, with a white you know white face white shirt and then after the first hour, there's four people, and then the next hour, there's eight people. And as you go throughout the day, you start seeing more and more and more people. And the whole thing culminates in the end of the day when uh, there's an assembly. And in this assembly, they put a funeral on for one of the students, as though one of your fellow students had died in an alcohol-related car accident. Now, they tell you this is all fake. They're not manipulating you to that extent. But they wanted you to go through the motions of what that would be like if one of your friends was hit by a drunk driver or if one of your friends was in a car with a drunk driver and died. And so they, they bring this, this girl up, uh, and, or they bring her family up, and they give a eulogy, and her friends come up, and they tell stories, and it's this really emotional uh, experience. But the one weird thing about this whole thing was that there was a coffin on stage, and she was actually in the coffin. Often. Kind of weird. And so uh, I, as a student council member, got out of class for that entire day to be a part of this assembly and to be a part of bringing kids out of class, painting their faces, helping organize things, helping clean up. And whenever you get out of class for an entire day to help with something, you're not working for the entire day. Usually what happens is you get a job, you do that job, you come back, you get another job, but you might have to wait five or ten minutes in between, or they might say, okay, we're waiting for this next thing to happen. And so it just wouldn't make sense for you to go back to class for ten minutes and then come back out, so you just get out for the whole day. So during one of these little sessions, I just completed a job, and I was just getting ready to start another job, my, and my teacher said, hey, we don't actually have another job for you. What I need you to do is go wait. Do you guys hear that high-pitched noise? Yeah. Okay, me too. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's not me. I just want to make sure I wasn't going crazy here. <laughs> it's the implant. Um, anyways, <laughs> so during this, uh, during this five minutes, I'm sitting backstage, and my, my teacher said, your job is to wait for the coffin to get here. The, there was like a, a funeral home that was going to loan us a coffin for this event. So I'm sitting backstage with a buddy of mine, and, uh, and we're just waiting. And all of a sudden, we hear this knock, bam, 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 on the back door. And uh, at this particular auditorium, there was a garage door in the back, like way behind the curtains, way behind all the backstage stuff. There was a big garage door. And a lot of auditoriums have this so you can roll in big props and you don't have to like carry everything through regular doors. So they have a big garage door that goes right to the outside. So I open this door, and the guy with the coffin is standing there. And you ever see somebody like right away, you know that that person's not having a great day? And so I can tell this dude is not having a great day. He's flustered. He's hot. It's hot outside. He's like, oh, dude, I'm not even sure I'm in the right place, and I, I've got this coffin and I'm running late and he's like checking his watch and all this kind of stuff and I was like dude I know exactly what this is for you're in the right spot I can take this like you go on about your day I can it's good I got this and he was like oh are you a relief just wash over he's like are you sure and I was like yeah man you're good I'll sign your paper I'll do whatever right so we like we bring in the coffin we close the door he leaves that's not true we bring in the coffin he leaves then we close the door uh, otherwise <laughs> he would have just run straight into the door and so um he leaves, and now it's me and my friend Andrew in the coffin, and I'm trying to be a leader. I'm trying to think ahead. So I said, Andrew, I'm going to roll this out to where it goes on the stage, okay? You go tell Mr. Kinslow the coffin is here. So he leaves. I roll the coffin out onto the stage, and now it's just me in the coffin. <laughs> and do you ever have one of those ideas? <laughs> and, like, right away, you know two things about the idea. You know this is a horrible idea, and you also know I'm definitely going to do this. <laughs> So I climb into the coffin and I close the lids. Lids, plural. There are two lids. There's one that goes over your feet, one that goes over your face, and I'm laying in there. And I'm like, ha ah, this is going to be great. 
But I was laying in there for like a really long time. I really underestimated how long it was going to take my friend to walk to the other end of the school, get Mr. Kinslow and come all the way back. So I really thought a lot about my life in there. Um, <laughs> but eventually I hear footsteps, but it's like way too many footsteps. See, uh, I thought that Andrew would go get Mr. Kinslow. Those two would come back. They would come up to the stage. I would go, ha, right, and jump out of the coffin. And they would go, ha, like for a second. And we'd all have a good laugh about it. That's not what happened. Instead... Andrew went down to get Mr. Kinslow. Mr. Kinslow, I forgot, was teaching a class during that hour. And so he said, hey, guys, that's the thing I've been waiting for. Now we can start setting up. Now that the coffin's here, we can start setting up for the assembly. So everyone, we're done with class. Everyone come down to the auditorium. And we're all going to, uh, you can either sit there or you can help us get ready. So they walk into the auditorium. And he goes, oh, the coffin's here. I'm going to go look at it. Everyone else is like, well, I don't have anything to do. I'm going to go look at it, too. So instead of just one or two people coming up, now there's like 30 people coming up. <laughs> That was stage one of where this plan started to fall apart. <laughs> stage two is this. Um, I thought that Mr. Kinsel would walk up, he'd flip open the thing, he'd see my face, go, ah, like, but just for like a split second before he realized, oh, that's Kyle laying in there, right? Because Mr. Kinslow and I had spent a lot of time together. He was my uh, teacher for a couple different classes. He was also my student council sponsor. He knew what I looked like. He knew my face very well. However, as I mentioned, there were actually two lids on this coffin. One of them covered your face. The other one covered <laughs> your feet. And so... Uh, <laughs> He was very familiar with what my face looked like. He wasn't so familiar with how my feet looked any different from anyone else's feet. So he flips open the lid and just thinks, oh no, they sent us the wrong coffin. <laughs> He's just thinking somewhere they're burying an empty box right now. And so he flips open the lid, he sees my feet and I'm laying in there and I see just light coming in and I was like, oh no. <laughs> And then he echoes my thoughts. He goes, oh, no, 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 no. And he starts backing away from the coffin. And I hear 30 people collectively go, <gasps> all at one time. And I was like, this is my moment. So I push open the lid and I'm like, <laughs> I have never seen someone's face go from ghost white to like, I am going to murder you red. He went from having no blood in his face to having every drop of blood in his entire body was like right here. He was so red. He was like, you want to be in a coffin? I will put you in a coffin. <laughs> now, I tell that story for two reasons. One, because it's hilarious. And two, because it illustrates a good point, which is that oftentimes in life, we are afraid of things that we shouldn't be. Oftentimes in life, we're afraid of things that aren't worth being afraid of. I'll give you another example. Um, growing up, my parents lived uh, in the same house my entire life. They still live in that house. And when I was growing up, that house is at the end of a dead-end road in the middle of the country. They're the, la the last house on their side of the road. And for years, they were the last house anywhere near there. And so when you would walk outside at night and you would look up or look around, you would not see lights from a city. You would not see lights from even any other houses. It was just pitch black, just nature, stars, wilderness. You're in the middle of nowhere. And then my seventh grade year, somebody bought some land up the hill. My parents live in a valley. They live on one side of the hill. It keeps going down and then it goes back up again. Somebody bought some land overlooking our house, and they built a house up there. Now, during the spring and the summer, you couldn't really see their house because of the leaves, but when the leaves fell in the fall and when they stayed down in the winter, you still couldn't see the house during the day because it was a brown house and it was through the trees. It wasn't, you'd have to really look for it. But at night, when it's dark and they had their lights on, you could see their lights coming down. Now, every year, my parents let me have a Halloween party when I was like in middle school, and so all my friends would come over and we'd like do bobbing for apples, and we'd have like a little haunted house in our barn and, and all this kind of stuff. And so I had all my friends over every year. Now, some of my friends were, you know, my, my like diehard buddies and they'd come over to my house all the time. But most of the kids in my class, they would only come over to my house like that one time a year, maybe two times, right? And so there was this one kid named Marcus and we're all sitting in different places. We're all hanging out in different places because this party is very spread out. My parents, uh, all, like the house is where the food is and the bathrooms and stuff. And then down the hill, there's one barn and, and that's where like the, the like bobbing for apples and just different games and music and stuff is going on. And then there's another barn that's like an old falling down barn. that's like a haunted house. And then some people are just walking walking around, so it's very spread out. So I'm sitting in the just like music, dancing, hanging out, activities barn, and uh, my friend Marcus comes in, he's just been walking around. Now Marcus had not been there since the previous year, and during that time, that house had been built. So he walks in, and he goes, hey Kyle, I didn't know there was a house up on that hill. And you ever have something that just comes out of your mouth, and you don't really know where it came from? And, uh, and I go, there's not a house on that hill. <laughs> and Marcus is like, no, no, like, and there's no windows in this barn, so he's just pointing at, like, a wall. He's like, no, like, like this way, there's like, a, there's, like, a house up there. But you can tell he's, like, losing confidence in whether or not there's a house up there. <laughs> he's like, there's, like, a house, like, up here. 
I wasn't there last year. And I was like, yeah, it's still not there. There's not a house there. <laughs> and he's like, dude, I swear, I just, not like this hill over here, like this one. And he's like trying to really narrow down where this house is. And I was like, Marcus, this isn't funny. And he's like, what are you, he's like, what do you, what do you mean? And you can tell he's like, is Kyle messing with me or not? And uh, he's like, what do you mean it's not funny? And I was like, Marcus, that house burned down 30 years ago. <laughs> and he looks at me, he's like, I swear, dude, there is a house on that hill. <laughs> and I was like, it's not funny, man. Just, it's not true. <laughs> and I realized later I never told him that uh, <laughs> he's probably still dealing with that. <laughs> Now, again, I tell that story for two reasons. One, because it's funny, and two, because it illustrates this point, that oftentimes in life we're afraid of things because other people hand us that fear or because other people give us that and say, you should be afraid of this. And ultimately, it's not something that we really need to be afraid of. And guys, for the last six years of my life, going on seven years, I've been traveling all over the country as a motivational speaker, and I've done events like this. Some of you guys saw me last year, right? And I've, seen, I've, I've done uh, conferences and uh, assemblies for groups like FFA, 4-H, FBLA, FCCLA. If it starts with an F and ends with an A, I've probably done it, right? And I, I go all over the country, and I've gone all over, and, and this is what I do. And I talk, for the last six years, I've been talking about this idea that our lives are telling stories. And I've been talking to people about what kind of story do you want to live. However... I think if I'm honest with myself, I haven't been completely transparent about my story. And I've been a little bit afraid to share bits about my story. Now, if you were to have seen me in the past, or even if you were to just judge me based on the last 10 minutes or five minutes, however long I've been up here, and you were to say, hey, you saw Kyle speak. What, what did you think of him? The vast majority of people for over the last six years or over the last six minutes would walk up and go, oh, he was funny. Kyle's really funny. And that's a big part of my story. I've always loved making people laugh. I've always loved bringing joy to people, making people smile, right? One of my favorite things in the world is when I can get somebody to laugh when I know they don't want to laugh, right? When somebody's like, like sometimes my wife, I've spent all day just being obnoxious and she's like, I can't laugh at him anymore. It's going to encourage him. And then like, she's, so she's really trying to lock it down. And if I can get a laugh out of her, that's like my favorite thing in the world. But that's not the entirety of my personality. Laughter and joy is only one part of it. And I think over the last six years, I've been a little bit scared maybe to share some other parts of my story that weren't so funny. See, I grew up going to this little school, right? This little tiny private school. It was like, it's very small. It's like this big. <laughs> and I didn't fit in. Get it? Uh, <laughs> That's a horrible joke, but it's true. I didn't fit in at this school. It's a little private school, and everyone there was, like, very, like, buttoned up, right? And I'm just, like, you know, buttoned up over a T-shirt kind of a guy. And I was, like, bouncing off the walls, and all the parents were, like, children are going to be seen and not heard and behave yourself and all this kind of stuff. And I'm, like, pew, 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 right? Firing off Roman candles in class and stuff. And uh, I never did that. Thought about it. Um, <laughs> And I was just this crazy kid with tons of energy. I was that kid that ever, like, I, when I got married, I was talking to my wife about school one time, and I was like, yeah, you know, like how I, every year, somehow it came up in conversation that every year of my entire life, I went to the principal's office. And she was like, that's not a normal thing that people do. And I was like, really? I thought I was just like checking in every year. Here I am again. You're still the principal. Cool. Uh, and so I was always like, I was always that kid that the teacher was like, oh, you got a lot of energy. You just need to focus that. You need to channel that. Let's bring it in a little bit, okay? But I didn't fit in in the classroom. I didn't fit in with a lot of the other students because they were all like very well-behaved kids. And I was just felt like I had all this energy. And I would have kids over. I had like friends, kind of. They were like, like second or third tier friends. But I didn't have like a friend who I felt like this guy is my person. Like people at school were nice to me. I wasn't bullied. I wasn't picked on or anything like that. But I just didn't feel like anybody was like me. And I remember going, and I would have friends over to my house, and, and they'd come spend the night and stuff, and we'd have a blast. And, you know, I was the only guy that everyone else lived in the city. I lived in the country. We'd go exploring, and, you know, we'd go throwing stuff in the creek and the pond and, like, building stuff out of rocks and climbing trees and stuff. And they'd be like, oh, my gosh, I never get to do this anywhere. And then we'd have a blast. And then they'd go back to their house, and then school would come on Monday, and we'd, and we'd go, and then they would never, like, have me over to their house. And so I'd be like, okay, like, come back over, right? And I'd have them back over. And every time they'd be like, that was so much fun. And then every time school would come, and they would never have me over to their house. And so finally, I remember asking this kid, like, hey, what's the deal? Like, it's not, I don't think that friendship has to be a scoreboard, and it's like one for one and everything, but it does seem a little bit lopsided that I've had you over like a hundred times, and you've had me over like roughly zero times. <laughs> and he said, dude, I want to have you over. I think you're cool. I like you, but my mom says I can't. I was like, your mom says you can't, like, have people over? No, no I can't have you over, <laughs> specifically. And I, he said, she says you're not a good influence. She said you're too crazy. You're not welcome in our house. Yeah, wow, that's a hard thing to hear when you're in third grade, right? 
It is because when you're a kid, adults are supposed to be the people who are guiding you and showing you what life is supposed to be like and encouraging you and keeping you safe and watching over you and stuff. But to hear an adult say, you're not welcome in my home, we laugh now and I can laugh at it being 30 years old. But in third grade, I wasn't laughing. And in third grade, that was the thing where I felt like maybe... Maybe something's wrong with me because nobody here at school seems to be like me. And, and the parents are saying, hey, this guy's, he's not welcome in our home. And I remember in third grade, like I would go home and just bawl my eyes out. And in fourth grade, like I always try to keep it together at school, right? Because like the last person to get a friend is the person who seems really desperate to get a friend, right? And so he's like, you just got to play it cool, man. Act like everything's fine. So you'd see people pairing off like, oh, he's going to go spend the night at his house. He's going to go spend the night at his house on Friday. And I was always just like, yeah, it's cool, guys. Don't worry. I've got too much stuff going on. I couldn't come anyways. And they're like, you weren't invited, right? And uh, then I'll get out of school and I'll get in the van and I'll slide the door shut and I'll just lose it. I'll just break down. And I remember just going, like, I, I just want one friend. Is that, like, too much to ask? Just one friend. And I remember in third grade and in fourth grade thinking, maybe, maybe I've, something went wrong in the manufacturing process. Or maybe I'm broken. Maybe I don't fit into this world. And maybe the world would be better if, without me. And when you're in third grade and fourth grade having thoughts like that, that's not a great thing. And then fifth grade came. Day one of fifth grade, a new kid shows up. His name's Zach. And Zach was my people. <laughs> Zach had too much, too much energy. Zach was sarcastic. Zach was bouncing off the walls. Zach didn't always have a filter between here and here, right? <laughs> and Zach and I clicked. And I remember being like, this guy is my guy. And, and a couple weeks after school started, he said, hey, dude, would you like ever want to come over to my house or anything? And I'm like, play it cool, dude. Just play it cool. Don't show him that that's all you have ever wanted in your life. <laughs> And I was like, yeah, I mean, yeah I, I mean, I guess, I guess I could come over or whatever. And I was like, what are you thinking, right? Because in my house, I have two brothers, and both of my parents work. And so our house was like if, an, always just a disaster from uh, like my brothers and I making it a mess. And so if we ever wanted to have somebody over, we had to plan it out like six months in advance, get the crew of hoarders to come over and like clear out all the stuff, find the floor again, all of that. And so I had to like make plans. And so I was thinking, he, he said, would you ever want to come over? And I'm like, yeah, what are you thinking? Like January, you know, February? This is like August, you know? And uh He's like, well, what about today? I'm like, you can do that? <laughs> you can have someone to your house the same day you have the idea to have them to your house? <laughs> right? Just, my mind just exploded. And he was like, well, I got to talk to my mom, but I'm sure it'll be fine. His mom comes after school. He goes over to the car, and he's <laughs> there, you know, doing their thing. And then he goes, hey, yeah, come on over. He goes, I'll call. My mom will call your mom, and my people will call your people. And we worked it all out. I went over to Zach's house. That was the first time. I was fifth grade. It was the first time I'd ever spent the night at anybody's house. And it was awesome. And not only did Zach, like, click with me, but his family, they, I wasn't, like, this thing to be protected. Like, he, you know, I never got to spend the night at anybody's house before that, but I'd go to, like, birthday parties and stuff, and they'd be like, all right, Kyle, this is the room that you can be in, okay? Don't touch anything, right? Do not go in that room. Absolutely not. There's china in there. There's things that are breakable. No, uh, right? But in, in, in Zach's house, his, his mom was like, hey, I, like, do you, can I make you a sandwich or something? And do you want anything? And hey, anything you want, and just the cabinets are yours. Like, just make yourself at home. Zach's mom was like my second mom for the next several years. And, and then Zach's parents would, were like, hey, do you want to go on vacation with us, right? I got to go to Florida with Zach. I, like, all of a sudden, my life completely changed. Now, here's the interesting thing is that my life didn't actually change at all, aside from one person. At school, I was still getting in trouble. I was still going to the principal's office. They were still like, Kyle, I know this isn't in the rules, but why would you even do that, right? Uh, <laughs> I was the kid that they made new rules the next year. They're like, all right, here's the Kyle Sheely addendum. No, you can't do that. I still didn't feel like I fit in. I still didn't feel like all the teachers really liked me. I still didn't feel like I, me I meshed with all the other kids, but I had one friend. And that's all it took. And I realized in that moment, see, Zach taught me that it only takes one. It only takes one person to make you realize that you're not alone anymore. It doesn't take a huge crowd. It can. That's great. But it only takes one person. Unfortunately, Zach and I uh, went to different high schools. Our school, our, our, our private little middle school that we went to stopped at eighth grade, and we lived in different districts, so we went to different high schools. And we stayed in touch, and we're still friends and all that, but it's just different. It's different not having a friend that's, like, with you every day. So I started over again, it seemed like. Public school, and I, I didn't know anybody. It was a small-town school. Everybody had known each other their whole life. They had all gone there since, like, kindergarten. I was a new kid. And once again, I didn't feel like I fit in. And once again, I didn't feel like I knew anybody. And once again, I felt like, what's wrong with me? And I remember, uh, in, you know, fifth grade, Zach taught me that it only takes one person to make you feel not alone anymore. And in high school, a kid, we'll call him John, he taught me that it only takes one person to make you pretty miserable. See, this kid named John, he didn't like me, and I don't know what I ever did to him. I don't know why he specifically hated me, but he made it very clear that he didn't like me from day one. 
And when I say he made it very clear, I don't mean he like beat around the bush or he just gave me dirty looks. He literally would tell me every time he saw me, I don't like you. Hey, Kyle, I don't like you. Thanks, John. Appreciate the reminder. <laughs> Wasn't sure if it changed from 10 minutes ago when you told me that, but I appreciate you keeping me, you know, up to date. Every time he would see me, and he wouldn't just tell me that. He would tell other people he didn't like me. He would make fun of me. He would, like, just give me a, a hard time with everybody. I was like, what did I do to this guy? One time, I was, uh, some guys were out playing catch, like football or frisbee or something in the courtyard, and they got it, whatever they were throwing, they got it stuck in a tree. And it was like 15, 20 feet up in this tree, and I was like, I got it. I climb up in this tree, 15 feet up, and it's not like a big tree. It's like a wobbly tree. Like, and you get up there, and it's like, whoa, this is a bad idea. And uh, <laughs> John comes around the corner, sees me up there, and goes, perfect opportunity. starts throwing rocks at me. Hits me in the face with a rock. And, it, and you ever get hit in the nose with something and you instantly, like, tears come? And uh, like, I was like, oh, and I'm holding onto this tree in a frisbee, right? And uh, I get nailed, and I was like, whoa. And I just went like this. Just one time, I was like, ah. Oh. And he saw me do that, and he was like, look, he's crying. And he goes off and tells everybody that I was crying. But what he didn't know is that that wasn't the only time I was crying. It was, again, every night I would go home from school, and I would just lose it. And I just felt like, why does this keep happening? I thought I was done with this. I thought this was behind me. See, John told me that only taught me, or showed me that it only takes one person to make you feel pretty miserable. But Travis taught me that it only takes one person to stand up for someone else. Travis is my older brother. He still is my older brother. Uh, <laughs> Travis was a junior when I was a freshman. And so we, we didn't really hang out that much in school. Like, you know, it's just he was an upperclassman. I was an underclassman. He was good at football. I was not uh, any of those things. And so he, it was helpful to have him at school. But it wasn't like he could solve all of my friendship problems. But he could solve my John problem. See, because John also played on the football team. And one day, uh, Travis had heard me talking about what, what this guy was doing to me and just how rough he was making my life. And Travis walks into the locker room and hears John talking to other people about me and just you know, making fun of me and all this kind of stuff. And Travis walks around the corner. Now, one thing you need to know about Travis is that at the time, he was 6'4", 350 pounds. He's a big boy. He went on to play uh, as an offensive lineman from Missouri Southern. He was like a college football guy. He was a big dude. And, and uh, so Travis walks around the corner like boom, 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 right? And he's like, I'm sorry, were you saying something? And John was like, no. Uh, nope, sure wasn't. Uh, I gotta go. And Travis just kind of, John was, John was standing behind this, or with his back pretty close to this locker, and Travis just kind of walks up, and John kind of backs up to the locker, and Travis just goes, hey, I don't know what exactly you're talking about. I just, two things, unrelated. Uh, I just want to let you know, I love my family. Uh, that's number one. And then two, um, not afraid to go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> just take that for what it is. Uh, just wanted to let those facts be known. And, uh, and he left. John never bothered me again. They never found his body either. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> He's fine. Now, here's the thing. I want to make this abundantly clear. I don't hold anything against John, all right? I, 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 in fact, I, I kind of feel sorry for him because I'm sure that what he was doing to me was probably coming out of something that somebody else is doing to him. Somebody made him feel uh, unvalued, and so he made me feel the same way. I don't, I don't hold that against him at all. But he made my life really, really hard for a long time. And Travis taught me it only takes one person to stand up for someone else. And as I've gone through my life, I realized Zach showed me it only takes one person to make you feel like you're not alone. Uh, John told me it only takes one person to make you feel extremely, extremely alone. And Travis showed me that it only takes one person to stand up for someone else and say, hey, that's not cool. You don't get to do that. You don't get to treat that person that way. And over the course of my life, I've realized that almost everything in life boils down to one person. Almost everything can be done by one person. We like to focus on these big movements. We like to focus on these big organizations and big things, but ultimately it all boils down to individual people making individual differences in their lives. Excuse me. <laughs> There's this saying that uh, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, right? If you have a 10-foot chain, but the middle piece of that chain is made of like a bread twisty tie, you really have two five-foot chains, right? Pretty quickly. And two five-foot chains don't really do much when you need a 10-foot chain. And the same thing is true of organizations. An organization is only as strong as the individuals within that organization. See, guys, we like to talk about 4-H doing this or 4-H doing that. But the truth is that 4-H cannot do anything. 4-H is not a sentient being. 4-H does not have a body. 4-H does not have a mind. 4-H is made up of all of you guys and all of the rest of the members who couldn't make it here today. And so if 4-H as an organization says, we're going to go this way, and all of you go, nope, we're going this way, 4-H doesn't just materialize out of thin air as this other thing and go do that. Nothing happens. 
See, 4-H is not, is not anything without you guys. 4-H isn't anything without the extension agents. 4-H isn't anything without your parents and, and, and other people who help you do what you're trying to do. And 4-H will be nothing if you guys don't decide to move in the direction that 4-H is saying that they're going to move in. So many times we focus on big things. We focus on big events, big uh, fundraisers, big movements, without realizing that all those things boil down to individual decisions. Uh, a couple years ago, I had my 10-year high school reunion. And having a 10-year high school reunion is a weird thing. Because when you're in high school, and I know I hate to break uh, your bubbles for those of you who are in high school, I know you think, I'm going to stay in touch with all these people, and we're going to be friends forever. It's not true. You will graduate, and you will never see most of those people again. Except on Facebook. That's about it. Or Snapchat. I don't know what you kids are using. And, uh, and you go your separate ways, then you get an email from somebody that goes, hey, it's our 10-year reunion. Well, oh my gosh, I feel old. And then you go back to this, this some restaurant or something, and you sit there for two or three hours, and you catch up with people. And you go, oh my gosh, you had kids, and you got a job, and you did this, and you did that. And you're trying to like cram 10 years of not seeing people into like three hours of, of time. And I was listening to all the conversations, and I'm making notes, and it was interesting for me as someone who still works with a lot of high school students to hear what people 10 years after high school wanted to talk about. And you know what they didn't want to talk about? You know what I never heard one person say? Not one person said, remember that motivational speaker that came to our school? Man. And we had lots of motivational speakers that came to our school. Most of them were horrible. Nobody said anything about that. Nobody wanted to talk about any of the big events. I was in student council for two years. I lost a lot of sleep and a lot of hours and spent a lot of my time and effort and energy working on big fundraisers and big events and dances and, and, and week-long spirit things and all this different stuff. Nobody talked about that at our 10-year reunion. You know what they talked about? Individuals. They talked about, hey, man, where, is Sarah here? Oh, man, she couldn't make it. She, she lives somewhere else now. Man, man remember how, how she would always just know when you were having a bad day? Remember Travis? You know how he would go out of his way to just say something nice to you all the time? Or remember this one teacher? Remember this one parent? We talked about parents who had made an investment of, of, of time, not only in their kids, but in all their kids' friends and all their classes and stuff. We talked about uh, administrators, principals, vice principals and stuff who would give you the benefit of the doubt or who wouldn't, right? We talked about like crazy librarians and stuff. We talked about teachers. We talked about individuals. See, so many times we like to focus on this big stuff and we don't realize that it all just boils down to individual people making individual choices. See, your day can be made by one person or your day can be completely ruined by one person. And not even one person, it can be one sentence. How many of you guys have ever had someone just completely make your day by saying one nice thing to you, right? Somebody can just go, hey, nice shirt. And you're like, oh my gosh. <laughs> it is a nice shirt, thank you. How many of you guys have ever had your day ruined by somebody saying one mean thing? And it can be the same thing. Isn't that weird? Somebody can go, hey, nice shirt. And you're like, oh, thank you. And somebody else can go, nice shirt. And you're like, I hate this shirt. <laughs> you're like burning it. See, each and every one of us has the power to, to make someone's day or break someone's day. We have the power to make someone feel alone or to show them that they're not alone. We have the power to... to Start something big on our campus, or to start something big on our 4-H club. We have something to start something big in our community, right? It only takes one person to go, "Hey guys, what if we did this?" And then it only takes one more person to go, "Yeah, let's do it." And all of a sudden, momentum starts building, and it only takes one person to go, "It's stupid. It'll never work." It just sucks the wind out of the air, doesn't it? And each and every one of you have the power to be whichever one of those people you want. And so, my question to you, to you today is, how are you going to use the power that you have? How are you going to use what you've got? Because here's the thing. If you put your trust in an organization, if you put your trust in some other thing or some big thing, then, then you're taking your responsibility and saying, oh, just, they'll take care of it. And when that happens, it doesn't matter how big the organization is. If the individuals in it don't care, nothing happens. I get, I get to travel all over the country. Like I mentioned earlier, I've done you know, student council and FCCLA and FBLA and 4-H and you know, all these different groups. And I've been to schools where they have over 100 students on their like, student leadership board or their student council or the ASB or whatever it is and nothing gets done. Over 100 students, right, or 200 students sometimes, this huge group, and nobody comes to meetings, nobody does anything, nobody leads anything, no, there's no school spirit, there's no things going on, there's no events, because, because everyone's just concerned with the group doing it, and nobody within the group is doing it. They're empowered, they've got the title, they were elected, or they were appointed, or whatever happened, they got into this big group, and nothing happens. And then, on the flip side, I've been to schools where one person cared, where one person who wasn't elected, who didn't have a title, who nobody, get, nobody asked them to do it, nobody gave them permission to do it, they just said, I'm going to do it. And they did it. 
Earlier this year, I went to a school where there was a girl who had um, struggled with depression of her own and suicidal thoughts. And she, she was actually hospitalized for a suicide attempt. And while she was in there, she started hearing stories from the staff there, and, and they were going, it seems like there's a lot of this at your school. And she goes, what do you mean? Nobody talks about this. They go, yeah, we've had like this many people every year from your school for like the last decade. Every year, people from your school are trying to kill themselves. And she said, nobody talks about this. And she went back to the school and said, hey, what's, is this real? And they were like, yeah, it's real, but we don't really know what to do about it. And she said, can I, can I try to do something about it? Because if I had known that, man, I would, maybe if somebody had talked to me or somebody had helped me, or maybe, maybe I can help somebody else, maybe I can save somebody else's life. And so she started holding these meetings every week during school. Just one hour during her lunch, she would give up her lunch, and they would make an announcement and say, if anybody wants to come and talk about what's going on in their life or stress or anxiety or whatever, just there's this room. They gave her one classroom that was just empty during lunch, and she started just being open about her struggles. She started being open about her anxiety. And all of a sudden, they went from having five or six suicide attempts a year to zero. Because one person who didn't have a job, who didn't have a title, nobody asked her to do it. She just said, I, I see a problem and I'm going to fix it. And that's what a leader does. One person has a chance to change the entire outlook of an organization, to change the entire culture, to change everyone's attitude about something. A couple years ago, a buddy of mine said, hey, Kyle, um, we're going to do this like after school or after, after school, after work softball league. Do you want to play? And I said, huh, no, I don't. Um, I'm, I don't. I don't play sports. I'm not good at sports. I'm super uncoordinated. Like my entire like uh, sports career in high school uh, ended when I like tripped over a basketball line and everyone made fun of me for the next 10 years. And so I was like, no, I'm good with sports, man. I'll just, I'll come watch or whatever. And he's like, no, you should play. It'll be fun. And I was like, it won't. I, can, I promise. And uh, but he kept bugging me about it. And then one time he was over and my wife was there. And he's like, hey, dude, you got to play softball. And my wife was like, oh, that'll be so much fun. And I was like, no, again, I can assure you it's not going to be great. And, um, but finally, after like weeks of this, he, was like, he came in one day. He's like, hey, dude, I don't want to pressure you or anything. But we cannot find the, one more player. We need one more player or we don't have enough people to sign up for the league. Will you please play? And I, my last ditch effort was like, dude, I don't even have a glove. And he was like, I have a glove. I was like, Fine. So I signed up for this league, and in this, in this particular like, park where you would sign up, there were four leagues, actually. And the first league, the bottom lowest one, was like every team started there. And it was for people who didn't really care about winning or losing. It was just kind of a, a fun thing to do after work or whatever, and it was very, you know, fun. That was kind of the, the name of the game was fun. And then it got a little bit more serious, a little bit more serious in the top, next two leagues, and the top league was all just like very, very serious, very competitive. These were guys who were like traveling and playing in other state, other leagues on the weekends and stuff. They took softball very seriously. We somehow got put into that league. <laughs> we were a bunch of ragtag guys who had never played together at all. It was just like, oh, this will be a fun thing to do after school or after work. Uh, and I keep saying after school. I don't know why. And we thought, oh, it'll be just fun. And I guess what had happened was that we later found out that our team captain, when he went to sign us up and pay our money or whatever, they said, what league do you want to be in? And he said, well, these are all guys we've never played together before. A lot of the guys played some sport in high school, but that was, you know, several years ago. And so probably just one of the middle leagues, I guess, maybe the lowest league. I don't know. Definitely not the top one. You guys just put us in whatever league you think. And what happened was they needed one more team to make that top league happen. My team needed m me to make that team happen. Basically, I was responsible for all of this. <laughs> First game, we show up. And like, just to give you an idea of what these people were like in this league, I use the word people loosely. They were like creatures. They were monsters. <laughs> if you and like four of your friends and me all got together and like hugged each other, that's like how big like one of their biceps was. That was just like, <laughs> like I don't want to judge anyone, but they were definitely using steroids all the time, for sure. <laughs> these were just huge dudes. And they would get up in there and they were just like, we'd pitch it and they'd go, just every time, out of the park, out of the park, out of the park. Uh, there was a, a league rule called the run rule that if you were down by 20 runs or more, which is a lot in baseball, I'm told, they would just call the game. We lost every single game by that run rule, <laughs> except for one. And we lost that game too, don't get me wrong. But we didn't lose it by the run rule, so it's basically winning. First game, we show up. And we get out there, and we are just getting dominated. Just like we are, we are getting no runs. We are getting nothing at all. We're down like 6 or 8 or 10 to 0. The other team's at bat, and I'm the catcher. Pitcher throws. Oh, it's softball. It's probably underhand, right? He throws. The guy just, poof, he hits this line drive straight at uh, one of our guys, our shortstop. And the ball was doing this like weird thing. I don't know if there's like wind or uh, there's spin on the ball or if there's a wizard involved somehow. I'm not sure. <laughs> 
the ball's doing one of these things, and the, the guy's like, whoa, and then it, it, I see it, like, he kind of moves, and it hits his leg, and then it bounces off his other leg, and he catches it, throws the guy out, and then falls on the ground. He's, like, screaming. And I'm like, dude, please get up. You're embarrassing us, right? <laughs> We're already losing by a million points. Just please stop. But he doesn't stop, and he's just screaming and screaming. So our, like, captain runs over, and he's like, hey, dude, what's going on? Right? And you can just see his blood drains out of his face. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. So I, like, walk over there. I'm like, what's going on here? Well, here's what happened. There's this little thing when, uh, in the back of a baseball glove. It's a hole where people put their finger out for some reason. Yeah, you can see where this is going. The ball somehow missed the glove, hit the finger, snapped the finger in half. His finger is now, like, hanging off, which makes it all that much more impressive that he threw the guy out, am I right? <laughs> so he has to leave, obviously. We really can't fix it there. I was like, just play through it. You'll, we're fine. Uh, <laughs> he goes to the hospital. Now we're down one guy. And remember, we only had the minimum amount of people to even be in the league. So they were like, you have to find another player or else you forfeit this game. So we're like begging people in the stands. They're like, you guys seem to have bad luck. We're not playing for you. <laughs> so finally, this guy remembers, dude, I've, I've got, I know this guy. He lives like five minutes away from here. So he calls the guy. And, the, and we only have like 10 minutes to get this guy here. And five minutes has already elapsed. So it's like, you have to get in your car right now. And the guy's like, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I'll come. He comes. He's 10 minutes late. <laughs> but the ref or the ump was like, yeah, it's fine. I, like, he's coming. It's, he probably got stuck in traffic or whatever. He shows up, and keep in mind, he kind of knows one person on our team. That's it. He shows up, and he's wearing uh, shorts that come up to, like, maybe here. <laughs> and he's wearing, like, a skin-tight, like, T-shirt with the sleeves ripped off. And the reason he was late was it because he had a full beard, and he thought it would be funny if he took the time to shave it into, a, like, a handlebar mustache. <laughs> We're like, we need you here right away. He's like, absolutely, right after one thing. Right? So he shows up, short shorts. <laughs> Super tight, ripped off shirt, handlebar mustache, and a stupid hat that's like kind of off to one side. He's like, what's up, guys? <laughs> and all of us just lost it. We were just dying. We're like, who is this guy? Now, if, if this were like a Hollywood movie, the, the next thing that would happen is that that guy would, would come, and we'd all laugh, and we'd be like rallied around like, oh my gosh, like this is so great, and would change all of our attitudes and everything, and like we would win the game, and then we would win all the games, and we'd win the league, and we'd carry that guy out on the field, trying not to touch his legs, right? And uh, <laughs> that's not what happened. I already told you, we lost all of our games. We lost that game pretty quickly after that guy got there. But that guy was like, hey, you, you guys are going to need a guy next week too, right? And I was like, I don't think that guy's finger is going to be ready in seven days. Uh, yeah, so he came back the next week, and he wore the same thing. <laughs> and the next week, another guy wore the same thing. And the week after that, I worked right next to a thrift store and walked over, and I was like, we're the short short section here. <laughs> and I wore short shorts, and I shaved my beard into a stupid mustache. And my wife was like, I hate that guy. And... Uh, <laughs> And I went and bought like a baseball jersey and ripped the sleeves off of it. And I was like, listen, we not, might not be able to win, but we can at least make these guys laugh. So we would go out there and these big, like beefy, very serious softball guys who never would smile, right? They're just like, right, spitting, whatever. And there's like seeds. And, uh, and they're just, you know, angry looking all the time. And then I'd come out there in my short shorts, you know, and my cutoff thing. And I'd, you know, kind of stick my butt out there, wiggling around. And they would start laughing. See, that one guy, he didn't change. He didn't make us all of a sudden better, right? It wasn't like a Space Jam moment where we all, you know, realized that we had it in us the whole time. It wasn't like that. We didn't have it. Uh, we did the math, and we're like, even if we were to compete with them, we'd have to take this many steroids, and that would kill us. You have to build up to that. Uh, but that one guy changed our entire attitude. He changed the way that we approached it. See, oftentimes you're going to be in a situation where you might not be able to get everything that you want. You might not be able to change everything and have everything work out for the best. And, and it's just this, this Hollywood story. But you can change your attitude and you can change the attitude of the people around you. And that's the first step to making significant change in a situation. See, so many times we talk about the big things, but we don't focus on the little things. So many times we talk about these huge things and we don't realize that it starts where we're at. The thing that I love about the 4-H pledge is it says my club and then what? My and then, and then my world, right? My club, my community, my country, then my world. And that is how it works. So many times we go, I want to change the world. And we go, what are you doing in your, at your club? And they go, no, 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 not my club. I want to change the world. Okay, what are you doing in your community? Not my community. I want to change the world. What are you doing in your country? Dude, I want to change the world. I'm like, yeah, the, your club, your community, your country are all in the world. Same world. So many times we think it happens top down. 
right? We think one person gets elected or gets appointed and they say, here's the rules, and we all just follow those rules. But the fact of the matter is, real change starts bottom up. It starts when one person makes a difference for another person, when one person reaches out to another person, when one person has an idea for how their club could increase their enrollment or increase their membership or increase their involvement or do something cool for their community. And they say, hey guys, what if we did this? And then another person goes, yeah, I think that's a good idea. And then other people come around and they change their club. And then that club starts doing stuff in the community and other people start noticing, oh, what's going on here? And then the community gets changed. And then they start changing their country. And then we can start talking about the world. So what are you going to do? Well, how are you going to use the one life that you have? I mentioned at the beginning of this talk that I, for six years, I just talked about funny stuff, right? And I, and I made a difference during that time. I wasn't all just me, you know, just making jokes and stuff. I, I haven't been a stand-up comedian. But I did kind of keep some of this stuff back. And you might be wondering, well, why did you start now? Why now? Well, what happened was, earlier this year, I was in Wisconsin, and I was giving a talk I was actually giving nine talks in like three or four days. I was going to different schools and, and doing parent talks and doing assemblies and all this kind of stuff. And it was just exhausting. And normally when I go give a talk at a school, afterwards, the, the, the school, the bell rings, everyone's out of there immediately. They go, you've got 35 minutes, you've got 40 minutes, whatever time they give me. And then it's like, bam, the second you're done, they're out of there. They have, to, they have a schedule they have to keep, they've got all this stuff. Well, this organization, this community foundation had brought me in. They had put me in a hotel for four days. They you know, paid me to do all these talks and stuff. And they said, if we're going to do this, if we're really going to make this work, we want to make sure that it makes a difference. And in order for that to happen, we feel like if a student is moved by something that happens in that assembly, they should be able to talk to Kyle. They should be able to ha ask questions or get involved or whatever, not just go right back to class. So they told all the principals, we will give you a free assembly, we'll pay for it, we'll organize it, all this kind of stuff, but on the one condition that if anybody wants to talk to Kyle afterwards, they can. And the principal said, fine, which was awesome. So sometimes I would give a 45-minute talk, and then I would be standing around for two hours afterwards as people came up and asked questions and interacted and told stories. And listen, some of that I know was just because the principal said, hey, if you need to talk, you can, you know, stay out of class. And someone's like, I got a math test next hour. Yeah, I got some questions. Uh, but some of it was real stuff. People told me some, some real difficult things that were going on in their life. There were a couple times when, when I had you know, kind of motion to a counselor or somebody who was in the back or a principal and go, hey, I think we need to talk about this a little more. I think we need to make some phone calls, right? And at this one school, I'd been standing around for an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes, and finally the end of the line gets there, and this is this little girl. It's just tiny, like, very small little girl. She would have fit in my old school. Um, <laughs> she wasn't really that. She was probably about this big. Little, little tiny middle schooler, like glasses, real thin, and just, and she comes up. And I knew the second I saw her, right after the talk got out, that she was going to be the very last person to talk to me. Because she kept, like, any time the line would get longer, she would kind of just, oh, you guys can, and she would kind of scoot to the back of the line. And the whole time she was nervous, she was kind of standing at a distance, didn't want anyone to see her, didn't want to, like, anyone to hear. She waited until the very last person, and as she comes up, she's visibly shaking. Like, I can see her shaking. And that's not a good sign. Right? Usually when I see those kind of things happen, I, I'm, just, I'm just bracing myself. I'm like, this is going to be bad. We're going to have to make some calls. There's, there's been times when you have to call the police about, about a situation that someone tells you about. Or you have to call family, Department of Family Services or, or Welfare or any of these different places. And you go, hey, we need to get this person help immediately. And I'm, I'm already like running the scenarios in my mind. Okay, what do I do? What's going to happen? How do I? And this little girl walks up and she goes, hey, um, she's like shaking. She goes, hey, can I, can I ask you a question? I was like, yeah. Any, what, what can I do? And she goes, do you, ever, um, do you ever, like, worry? Do you ever deal with, like, anxiety? Do you ever worry about something and it just feels like you just... And in my head, I was like, that can't be the question. <laughs> right? Because, yeah, of course, the, the answer is yes. Everyone does. We all worry about stuff all the time and just pretend like our life is cool. Like, that's what you do. That's humanity, right? Um, and I was like, all of us are just walking around every day. And this is my favorite part of the talk because everyone's like, not me. I don't do that. No, nope. my life is actually really great. It's awesome. Don't look at me, please. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I was thinking like, yeah, all of us have those things inside of us. And everyone in this room has that thing that you're like, I hope nobody asks me about this. I'm really nervous about this. I'm worried about this. Maybe it's your future. Maybe it's your, your house, right? Maybe you go, man, I, I don't know if we're going to be able to pay the bills here. I don't know. Like, um, you know, the banks have been calling and stuff. Or maybe it's your, your parents. Like, you go, they've been fighting a lot, and I just, I'm really upset, and I don't know what's going to happen there. And, or maybe it's, who, who knows? Maybe it's an academic thing. Maybe it's a health thing. Maybe it's a social thing. Maybe it's, who, it could be anything. But all of us have that thing where constantly it's just running in the back of our mind. Don't let anybody see. Don't let anybody see that I, I'm worried about this. I'm falling apart. And we all just go with a smile on our face. Well, oh, it's great. No, it's fine. So when she said, like, hey, do you worry? I was like, yeah, yeah, of course. That can't be the question though and then I was like oh my gosh she doesn't know she walks around school every day worrying and falling apart and sees everybody else smiling and thinks what is wrong with me 
Th she thinks I'm broken. She thinks uh, nobody else seems to be having any issues at all, and I am. And she's trying to put on a good face, but doesn't realize that everyone else is doing it too. And so I just was like, oh my gosh. And I just gave her this big hug. And I was like, yes, yes, I do. And I said, you know, you want to know the secret though? Everybody else does too. And I said, every single one of those people that just stood in that line for the last hour and a half, all of them were telling me about stuff they worried about. Your teachers have stuff that they're worried about. Your friends, all the, pe the people, the popular kids, the unpopular kids, every person at the school has something they're worried about. I said, you're not alone. And when I said, you're not alone, she just like, <sighs> you could just like feel like the release of like, oh my gosh, okay. I'm not alone. And I realized when I said, you're not alone, and she like collapsed with like, oh my gosh, it's okay. I realized I, I had said the wrong thing. I didn't need to say all that stuff about all of your teachers and all of your friends and everyone for the last hour and a half. I, I didn't need to say all. That was all extra information. All I needed to tell her was that I did. Because it doesn't take a crowd full of people to not be alone. It takes one person for you to not feel alone. And as soon as I told her, I do, you're not alone. She was like, okay, good. And I remembered back to when Zach had come in and all of a sudden I was like, I'm not the only one. I don't care if all the rest of the kids in my class don't get me. I've got one guy that gets me. I'll close with this story. When I was in... Um, middle school, like early, early middle school, probably like maybe even like fourth or fifth grade, um, I, I got this idea that I thought it would be super cool to put glow-in-the-dark stars in my bedroom, right? I'm a cool dude. And uh, I didn't get like the big ones with like the big planets and stuff. I got like the little tiny ones because I wanted it to look like actual stars, right? And so I put them on the ceiling, but I didn't just put them on the ceiling. I also put them on the top half of the walls because when you're out, you know, out, outside, it's not, the stars aren't just like right up here. They're just anywhere, you know, over the horizon. So I put all these stars up and I made constellations and all this kind of stuff. And they're very tiny. So, and, and you know, at night I was like, oh, these look like actual stars. And that was my plan. I was like, it's going to look like I'm actually outside. And that plan backfired the first night. When I woke up and I thought I was outside. <laughs> As I mentioned, my parents live in the woods and, and my window was open. It was the summer and the breeze is coming in. And usually when I feel breeze, I don't, my first thought isn't I'm probably indoors right now. And so there's breeze coming in. There's no lights from neighbors or anything. So we don't have any neighbors. There's crickets. I can hear them outside. It sounds like outside. It feels like outside. And there's stars. And I'm, I, it was one of those things where I instantly knew. I was like, I know for a fact somebody put my bed in the woods. No questions on my mind. I didn't really think through, like, they would have had to turn the bed on the side and get it through the door and all this. I knew. I knew for a fact. And then I'm, like, thinking, and I'm, like, terrified. I'm, like, I don't even know where I am. I can't even see my house from here, right? And I'm just so scared. And, and I, then I realized, oh, you know what? Whoever did this, they did it just to mess with me, right? It's probably my brothers or, like, my mom and dad. I just thought it would be funny, I guess. And, and I'm, like, they've got to be, like, hiding nearby. They're, they're for sure, like, watching this, ready for me to freak out. So I started yelling. And I was like, hey, hey, okay, guys, all right, joke's over, let's, let's go home. I'm like, no one is answering. And I'm like, Serious, seriously, you guys, it's, it was funny and everything, I, seriously, great job. I don't know how I didn't wake up when you were carrying my bed into the forest, but um, like, let's just, it's kind of cold, let's go home, you know. And nobody answers. And I'm just like, I'm all alone out here. And I was terrified, you guys. I was so scared. And eventually, I just go like, I don't know why I didn't decide, I'll wait till daybreak, right? I thought, I have to walk home right now. <laughs> I didn't know where home was. I had no guidance, you know, anything. I was like, that's the North Star. Uh, <laughs> so I step out of bed. Apparently, I didn't realize that I was stepping on a carpet. I don't know. I was pretty tired. And um, I'm like, all right, here we go. I take three steps. One, two, three, boom! And just slam <laughs> slammed into the door. And do you ever have one of those thoughts that happens like faster than you thought a thought could happen? <laughs> like as my nose is making contact with the door, I was like, oh yeah, glow in the dark stars. Bam, right? <laughs> I slam into the door, my nose hurts. And apparently the yelling wasn't enough to wake up my brother, but the door was. <laughs> I slam into the door, I'm like, ah! And my brother from the next room goes, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I'm okay. Because I realized in that one moment that I wasn't alone anymore. And all of the fear was gone. The pain was there now. <laughs> I had to trade one thing for another. But all of a sudden I realized, oh, I'm not alone anymore. And realizing you're not alone is one of the best feelings that you can have. And that's a feeling that you can give to other people anytime you want. 
Because it only takes one person to make someone realize they're not alone. It only takes one person also to tear someone down. It only takes one person to build them up. It only takes one person to make someone's day. It only takes one person to ruin someone's day. And each and every one of us, if we're honest, have been all of those people in different days of our life. Nobody in this room has been 100% mean to everyone their entire life, and no one in this room has ever not made a mistake, right? There's no one perfect in here. We've all been, we've all made people's day. We've all uh, torn people down. And each and every day is a decision that we get to make. How am I going to use my one my one person, my one day, right? And I'll just encourage you guys to think about that. You guys have come from all over the state to be here. And yeah, there's going to be competitions, and some of you guys are going to be doing things where you're uh, you know, kind of competing, I guess, against other people. But ultimately, this isn't just about competing. This is about coming together with other people who are trying to do the same things that you're trying to do in other places. And coming together and being able to say, hey, you know what, this is an issue we're dealing with. We, we can't, uh, you know, we're not having enough members signing up. Or, or man, we, we're dealing with this issue. Or, or, or this is happening in our area of the state. And other people go, oh my gosh, we had that same problem. And here's what we did. And they go, but we're dealing with this. And you go, oh my gosh, we had that. And, we, and, and all of a sudden, instead of being just a bunch of people fighting, we're a bunch of people who get to come together and say, hey, how can we all make each other better? How can we all swap ideas and tactics and stories? Because even though it's your unique story, even though you're living your own unique problems, you're dealing with a lot of the same things in different ways in different parts of the state. What if you use this, this time, this week, to swap stories, to make a difference for other people, to reach out to other people? There's this quote that was from this guy who died over 100 years ago. It's one of my favorite quotes ever. It says, I am only one, but still I am one. He says, I cannot do everything, but I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. I want you guys to think about that. Every day when you wake up, tomorrow when you wake up, when you start school in a couple weeks, right? Every day when you get ready to go to school or when you get ready to, to work on the farm or you get ready to help your family or whatever it is that you're doing, go every day is an opportunity. I can't do everything. I can't make a difference in everyone's life, but that makes it that much more important that I make the difference in the person's life that I can. Each and every one of us are only one, but it only takes one. Thank you guys so much. You've been a fantastic audience. Give yourselves a round of applause. Can I get a picture with you guys? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Sheely. And Present, so if you would please come back out. Thank you so much. Okay. So we've talked about prizes, so let's talk about what they are, okay, and how to win them. Uh, so as you all know, we have different social media sites. So Twitter is a big one. So starting Tuesday. We're going to pick tweets at random times throughout the day. So we need you to be tweeting all day, Tuesday, and throughout the week. Make sure you use the hashtags, hashtag I am 4H16. Uh, if you don't know what the prizes are, there are some iTunes gift cards. There's two Fitbit Blazes. There's a nice waterproof um, speaker on Snapchat, if you will, please take out your cellular devices. And if you take a picture and swipe over, we have a filter. So just like TLC, we have an awesome filter for Orama. So if you use your Snapchat and use the filter, Send it to us, Arkansas 4H, and we're going to screenshot it and pick out the most creative one. Um, if you do that, then you could win a $25 iTunes gift card. Throughout the college, there is six uh, posters or signs, and I need you to take a picture in front of all of them, make a collage of all of them, and then post it in the most creative one wins something, but I'm not going to tell you what. Um, also, we have an app or a yap this year. So if you're uploading a selfie of your group or uploading different pictures throughout the week, then you could win some awesome prizes. 
but make sure that you add us on all of those things. So how many of you went to District Arama? A lot of you. So who remembers me standing in front of you, screaming into my phone, and then turning it around in the new screen? Yeah, yeah, okay. So we're gonna do it here. Um, if you, okay. Um, so we've been sitting down for a little bit. So I need everybody, is this working? No, is, aha. Uh -huh. I need everybody to stand up, stretch. Don't hit anybody, but okay. Hold on, everybody pay attention, hold on, hold on. Okay, so I'm gonna say, Good afternoon, Arkansas 4 H. We're here. Blah, 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 blah. And then I'm going to turn the camera over to you, and I want you to go crazy. I mean, like, jump up and down and, like, woo! Okay, are we ready? Do we need a practice run or no? Okay, are we ready? Good afternoon, Arkansas 4 H. We are here at State Rama at the opening ceremony. Everybody say hey! <laughs> That was awesome, thank you guys. All right, we have a few more announcements. Uh, the buses that will take you to your competitive events off of campus depart on at 7.30 a.m. Thursday morning. They will be in lot 42 behind Maple Hill and Reed Hall. Uh, University 101 with the Provost Metal and Shine Fashion Show production and Dollar and Cents workshops have been canceled. Oh, but, <laughs> So those that were in those can go to reverse engineering your story with Kyla Sheely. So I don't know, that's a pretty good trade-off I'm going to say. Uh, in, in AFLS 107, and I'm sure somebody can help you figure that out. Uh, remember to go to college, uh, college career fair and Bumpers College pick picnic tomorrow and turn in your passport to win that $50 iTunes gets gift card. Uh -huh. Okay, right now? Right now. All right, so... Apparently there was a Rama Ready hashtag contest. I'm not a very good social media guy, but we have a winner for that, and that's gonna be Grayson Perkins. So um, also Bumpers College would like to recognize students who will be uh, starting at the Bumpers College in the fall by taking their picture and giving them some U of A gear. If you have 4-H or if there's any 4-Hers that are attending Bumpers College this fall, uh, stop by the Bumpers College picnic table during the picnic. Also, let's see, we got a few more, all sorts of announcements. Oh, if your county has not picked up your ambassador uh, polos, then please go to the lobby out there uh, to pick them up at the end of the ceremony. And also, for for everybody that's doing lo locomotion tonight, whoop, whoop, I know I am. The pizza is going to be served from 6:30 to 7:30, so that's important to remember because the food is the important part, guys. And <laughs> you have three hours from the first swipe of your card to play at locomotion. So that's a long time. Okay, one last one. Uh, Breakfast is from 6.30 to 8.30, Wednesday morning at Bruff Hall, or something like that, Bruff. <laughs> Bruff, yes, it's Bruff. That is not the one that we usually go to, so do not go to the one, if you've been to State of Rome in the past, that we usually go to. So, sorry about that. Your name tag is required for you to be able to eat, and uh, so be sure to take that with you. And it's on the map of your program, so look at that before you start walking around campus lost. And I believe that is all the announcements we have. Yes. All right, that is all that we have. Uh, that concludes our opening ceremony. <laughs>